you guys. Okay, well, apparently we're starting all at the beginning. Okay, so this week we're covering a couple of things. Thank you all for coming. Um, title of this one is We're Still in Pulmonary, so are you still short of breath? We're going over two cases again. There's a third one at the end that I don't think we will quite have enough time for, but it's in there uh, at the end, um, going over differentials for hemoptysis for both of these cases. So our first case is a 54-year-old gentleman is coming in, uh, shortness of breath. The opening vital signs that you receive are mildly tachycardic at 116, blood pressure is a little soft at 95 over 65, uh, breathing a little quickly at 22, uh, SpO2 91% on room air, and they are not febrile. On your doorway exam, they appear anxious and short of breath, but for their airway, they're speaking normally, breathing, they're tachypnic, but have clear lungs, and they have warm skin and intact distal pulses. For further history, you get that this is a 54-year-old man coming in with three days of worsening dyspnea on exertion, now feels short of breath even with minimal exertion, and has had right-sided chest pain that's worse with taking a deep breath and with coughing. Doesn't have any fevers or chills, but has had a dry cough with occasional streaks of blood. His additional review of systems is otherwise negative and has no past medical history, no social history, and doesn't take any daily medications. What is our differential diagnosis for this gentleman who is short of breath? You can either put it in the chat or uh, speak up to give a few suggestions. Uh, I'm thinking of heart failure, uh, pneumonia, or uh, maybe uh, never for us. Mm -hmm. Yep. Those are all good thoughts. So the list is pretty long. So we have to think about all of the things that are pulmonary in nature, including infection. I agree with you, as well as the structural causes, um, as well as we have to think about, is this possibly pseudo hemoptysis? Is this somebody who's coughing so hard that it's just secondary to bronchitis? But this is emergency medicine, and we have to rule out all of these other differentials first. Additionally, when you hear about someone who's short of breath and is having some blood uh, with coughing, you can think of the mnemonic. I know this is long. It's a battle camp. So it takes into account the structural etiologies, um, as well as some of the other thoughts that you could think about for someone with hemoptysis. So PE is on there, malignancy is on there, fistulas are on there, AV malformations, pneumonia, mitral stenosis. I agree with you with heart failure. You can sometimes get that pink frothy sputum and anything iatrogenic if someone has had a recent bronchoscopy or any recent uh, scopes, they can also have some hemoptysis versus hematemesis. Um, as we mentioned before, you have to think about pseudo hemoptysis, whereas maybe they had recent epistaxis, or if they have a malignancy that is in the upper airway in the oropharynx, and it's just dripping down and causing them to cough up some of that blood. So moving forward with our physical exam, Generally, uh, he looks uncomfortable. His chest, when you press on it, is not tender, but he's still tachycardic, but we're not hearing any murmurs. His lungs, he's tachypnic, labored, but clear to auscultation on both sides. Um, his abdomen and his extremities are normal appearing. Are there any interventions that anyone would do right now? As a reminder, he's mildly uh, tachypnic, mildly tachycardic, has a soft blood pressure and a SATI 91% on room air. Any labs anybody would like to order? Uh, I want to put him onto IV lines, put him on monitors, and I want to do some uh, labs like uh, material blood gas, um, uh, CMP, CBC, and chest x rays. Perfect. I agree with all of those things. Best thing to start with anybody like this is to put them on the monitor, correct the vital signs that we can correct by placing them 
on uh, oxygen. And then possibly I might think about giving him a little bit of fluid, not overloading him, but you can always start small. Um, I agree with you with imaging. Uh, this is somebody that I would get over to a chest x-ray and go from there. Um, and it doesn't sound like we would do any other interventions besides oxygen at this time and plus or minus IV fluid. And I agree with that. So this is an EKG that you call for. Uh, does anyone see anything interesting on this EKG or want to talk me through their process of interpreting it? I was on with that uh, EKG interpretation lecture uh, hosted by Ryan. So I know you guys are all really good at them. So. Uh, this is TJ from which your at least fast uh, sinus rhythm of about uh, maybe 150 bit per minute. And I can see the S1, T3, T3, which might indicate your pulmonary embolism. You're correct. This patient does have the classic S1, Q3, T3 that we're seeing here, as well as right axis deviation. Um, we can, we'll can we talk about this later in the case, but not everything that has the S1, Q3, T3 is a pulmonary embolus, and not all pulmonary emboluses have the S1, Q3, T3. But in this setting, it points us more towards a PE compared with anything else. Let me see if I can share the video this time, but this is a still of our trustful ultrasound that you pulled out. Let me see, let me share. Oh no, I had this pause, so this wouldn't do this. Okay, you get this echo. Play it one more time. And we'll move on to the second one. So going off of those images, what signs are we seeing on these ultrasounds? What are the abnormalities that we are worried about? Uh, the the ultrasound. ultrasound. I'm sorry, two, two people were speaking at the same time. Uh, can you repeat yourself? Uh, the total can work us. In the side of is the angry uh, pressure in the right, in the right heart. I think I heard dilation of the right heart. I agree. And then on the other uh, video clip that we had, we had something called the, the D sign on there, which again shows signs of right heart strain, kind of building off of what we talked about last week um, on the ultrasound findings for right heart strain, where you have the increased size of the right ventricle compared to the left. You have an increase in the ratio. Normally, it is um, either one to three or one to two. In this one, you can see that the septum is bowing towards the left, as well as the dilated right atrium. Moving forward, we have our lab values. Most of them are not very remarkable, except for those to the right side of your screen. We have a BNP of 385, a troponin of 0 0.55, which is elevated, and they decided to get a D-dimer and found that it was elevated at 800. We're gonna do a quick question while we pause and think about all of those results. Um, Birchow's triad, I don't know if you guys use these uh, named 
uh, signs over there, but uh, is noted to include all of the following except for venous stasis, hypercoagulability, hypokalemia, or endothelial injury. If you would please type your result or answer into the chat, I'd appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Dr. Hotu. Awesome. Yep, I good. Okay, yes, hypokalemia. So this is building off of the signs for um, ca causing a clot. So if you have these together, so the hypercoagulability, any endothelial injury, or venous stasis that increases your likelihood of clot formation and are things we have to think about when somebody might have a clot in the, as a DBT, uh, a PE, or even uh, going forward with a, a stroke or an MI. Any next steps for treatment for our patient right now? As a reminder, they have signs of right heart strain. They have a new oxygen requirement. They have the S1Q3, T3 on their EKG, and they have an elevated BNP, troponin, and D-dimer. Uh, I would uh, like them to have the uh, chest to CT scan first to uh, confirm P, and then we will move on with the um, uh, anti-promotive therapy. Okay. So it sounds like you would like some imaging first before moving on to any definitive therapy. I think that's very fair. So there's always thoughts if anybody would start heparin or TPA with that amount of information. Uh, some people may feel that the likelihood of having a pulmonary embolus is high enough that while they wait to get definitive imaging, they may start them on heparin. This patient is hemodynamically stable for now, so uh, there is always the question of if they need TPA, and that can be a discussion within your department. If you're considering heparin, it's 80 uh, units per kilogram in an IV volus, um, or we do it here at 0 0.5 units per kilogram maxed out at 5,000 units, um, and then put it on an infusion drip. Um, this patient, uh, as the way the case is written, suggests to put heparin on because uh, with your echo findings and your high clinical suspicion for a PE with the elevated BNP, troponin, and D-dimer, that they would recommend putting them on heparin before getting any definitive imaging. Are there any risk stratifications or algorithms that can help guide you uh, towards thinking if someone has a PE? These are scoring systems that have uh, specific names we're looking for. Uh, PC score, if yep. I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we have quite a few. PE has been lucky that it has so many for you to choose from. We have the Wells score, the Perk score, the modified Geneva score, PESI score if your patient is uh, possibly well enough to be able to go home and start it on anticoagulation, and the year score. Uh, personally, I don't use the year score or the modified Geneva score in my practice. Uh, do you use either of those there in Vietnam? Sounds like maybe not. Okay. So you go and you reassess your patient and your patient now is a bit more tachycardic, is now hypotensive at 65 over 45 and is now only satting 92% on a non-rib breather. What are possible interventions that you guys would want to start thinking about for this patient? Uh, I would uh, want to give him a uh, bolus of fluid, uh, and then if the uh, blood pressure uh, do not um, improve, I have uh, we have to give him some uh, <coughs> uh, not epinephrine. I agree with you. I think you need to start supporting his hemodynamics. So you give him a liter of fluid, and you start him on norepinephrine. 
His blood pressure improves, but he's still uh, hypotensive at 88 over 50 and is still 92% on the highest flow of oxygen that you have. And he is still tachycardic. And you have not gone over to get a CT yet. So in my practice, uh, this is somebody who we had started on heparin and would transition over to giving uh, TPA. Uh, some places are now transitioning over to tenecteplase or TNK to start a thrombolytic on this patient. This is somebody also who uh, we would check and getting started, uh, re getting ready to intubate. This patient has a high risk of cardiovascular collapse when we intubate them, unfortunately. In your PE patients, if they're able to stay awake and you can maintain their oxygenation uh, with some high flow, uh, just because when you intubate them, you're decreasing their preload and they need that extra help with a forward push with the presence of the clot in their pulmonary system. As I agree with Dr. Nanle that we start the norepinephrine and you have to talk about your, to your patients about any contraindications to thrombolytics. If they do not have any contraindications, then you can give them a bolus of either 10 to 15 milligrams, depending on the literature and what your current protocol is in your department. And then either a max of 100 milligrams or up to 50 milligrams, which is infused over two hours. At the same, simultaneously, you're discontinuing the heparin and you would discuss with interventional radiology to determine if this patient is a candidate for thrombectomy. This patient is obviously not going to the floor, especially if you intubate them, they're going to the ICU. Your primary diagnosis for this patient was massive pulmonary embolism. Your secondary diagnosis was obstructive shock secondary to their PE. So let's go over some thrombolytic contraindications because unfortunately we have to think about them in these patients as well as in our stroke patients. Maybe if someone else can help us with some contraindications to giving thrombolytics. Oh, well, now everybody knows them, but. Uh, some contraindicated indications that I remember are um, active bleeding, um, so possible aortic dissection, um, mm -hmm. recent intracranial hemorrhage, mm -hmm. uh, and intracranial nail blebs. Yep, exactly. Uh, it's never good to give thrombolytics to your dissection or possible dissection patients. Um, brain cancer, so any neoplasms or malignancies inside the brain, any surgery or trauma, including the intracranial hemorrhage in the past two months, any history of having intracranial bleeding. You're correct with any active bleeding. If you're known to have any uh, AV malformations, like in your GI tract, um, any recent strokes, either uh, embolic or hemorrhagic in the last three months. Um, are contraindications for getting TPA. There are also some relative contraindications. If someone has had major surgery, and sometimes that's a discussion of what constitutes a major surgery in the last month. If someone has had a recent history of internal bleeding, especially a GI bleed, if uh, they are having, if they're pregnant, if they have a known peptic ulcer, if they're older than 75, um, or if they have known uh, pericardial effusion, and the concern is that it's hemorrhagic or could convert to hemorrhagic. So your thrombolytics, uh, you have a mass, you get for massive PEs and submassive PEs. This patient had a massive PE because they had cardiovascular collapse and obstructive shock from there. So their systolic uh, blood pressure is less than 90. Um, or if they have a history of hypertension, if their sustained blood pressure is systolic is less than 100, uh, would constitute a massive PE and prompt you to give thrombolytics. Obviously, if they have arrested in front of you or if they're bradycardic. 
such that we talked about last week is that they start having circulatory collapse from the increased right-sided pressure to the point that the uh, SA node gets knocked out essentially from the over-distension and they can no longer compensate and move blood forward. Um, Submassive PE is characterized by any signs of uh, right heart strain, either on your pocus, on your CTA, or if you're seeing uh, elevation of the BNP trip or troponin. These patients may benefit from thrombolytics, although you can also still have a conversation with your interventional radiologist after you get a CTA to see if they would be better served by getting a thrombectomy or uh, IR-directed uh, TPA at a smaller dose. As we talked about earlier, the literature of either half-dose TPA or full-dose TPA is kind of up in the air and depends on your hospital and department protocol. If they use a maximum of 50 milligrams or 100 milligrams, starting with a small bolus and then infusing the rest over two hours. I don't know if uh, many of you have had complications or had to code a patient from a suspected PE, but these codes run long to be able to circulate the TPA once you give the bolus. Uh, they recommend at least 30 minutes, but these codes can often run if you have the resources to over an hour. Um, they also recommend, uh, something I found interesting is that the lower dose of TPA in a PE as compared with an MI or a stroke, and it's because 100% of the TPA uh, thrombolytic is infused, goes through the pulmonary arteries, whereas about 5% of TPA goes through the coronary arteries in an MI. The half-life of TPA is very short. It's about four minutes. So about each molecule of TPA can get circulated through the lungs about five times before the half-life is over. Um, and in the lungs, we don't need a full resolution of the clot for an improvement. Just any slight disintegration of the clot can have a sustained improved effect of your patient and can greatly improve their outcome. And you're not having the usually the complication of atherosclerosis in your patient in a PE for the pulmonary arteries as you are in your patients with an MI. So other interventions, uh, if your department has the capabilities, is that they can go on ECMO. This is especially helpful if you can see floating thrombi on the right side of the heart as in the picture over here. If they are having refractory hypotension despite uh, thrombolytics and despite uh, your presser support, and if they have any absolute contraindications to uh, getting TPA. Additionally, we kind of touched on the possibility of catheter-directed TPA, if that's something your institution has. Um, this is for patients who continue to be in shock and have failed uh, systemic TPA, or if it is an absolute contraindication. This is going back just to talk about our EKG that Dr. Nanlai was able to interpret for us is that it was sinus tachycardia. We talked about the S1Q3 T3. Um, although it is associated with PE patients, there are many patients uh, where this is seen in right heart strain or in patients who have neither. Um, it's You get the tall P wave in lead two due to the right atrial enlargement and you get uh, the small Q wave and prominent R wave in V1 due to the right ventricle dilation. Uh, oftentimes you will see the right axis deviation and either a complete or incomplete right bundle branch block, which will be new. Um, and then you can also see some ST elevation in leads V4 through V6. Uh, oftentimes this will resolve if you can uh, improve the clot burden in your PE and is due to the strain on the heart and is not associated with any additional um, clots that are found in the coronary arteries. Just as a reminder, we have our, oh, I don't see my pointer here. Okay, so S1, you have the inverted S in lead one, Q3, so you have the deeper Q wave and more prominent Q wave in lead three, and T3 with the inverted T wave and lead three prominent, uh, consistent with a likely PE or right heart strain in this patient. So we had met mentioned the PESI score and mentioned before that there are a few 
criteria that we use to help stratify if we believe a patient might have a PE. The first one that was developed was the WELL score, um, helping to risk stratify patients who might have a PE and try to see if we need uh, to get any further imaging or CT scans on these patients. So when this was developed, the inclusion criteria was that a PE was suspected, their symptoms were present for less than a month, and they had newer worsening dyspnea or chest pain. People who this was uh, not used in were pregnant patients, your pediatric patients, um, if they haven't had any symptoms within three days before coming in, or if they'd been on anticoagulation for over 24 hours, if they didn't believe that anybody was going to survive less than three months, um, if they had any contraindications to contrast, or if they thought that the DVT was in the upper extremity as the source of the PE. So you can read the criteria on the right. And we'll go over the PERC criteria next, and then we will see if we can risk stratify a patient together. So going off of the well score, they break it up by either the three-tier model or the two-tier model. And depending on your hospital system, it can depend on what D-dimer assay you have. If you have a high-sensitive D-dimer, oftentimes they will be using the three-tier model. Uh, to determine if they need to go to get a CTA. If you have a moderate high sensitivity D-dimer, then oftentimes the two-tier model with the cutoff of four is used and still has good sensitivity uh, to predict a PE with still a low miss rate on three-month follow-up. So in your two-tier model, which we'll use uh, as the hospital that I initially trained at did not have a high sensitivity D-dimer, we used the two-tier model. So if a patient um, had four or more, um, PE was likely if it was greater than four. And so they recommend getting imaging. Um, this was, if they were less than four, then you would get a D-dimer. And then based on if your D-dimer was positive, going off is that. Uh, Dr. Jane Yi has posed a question to everybody. If you are using a D-dimer in your decision-making for people to go over and get a CTA. Yeah, I'm just curious because I know some places may not have that test available. So I'm just curious what your practice at your particular ER is. Usually we will use the dadimer, dadimer, dadimer. If we have the high risk of the pulmonary embolism, uh, the patient have the DVT or uh, have the side of the, the, the right heart failure, and within so much about the, the PE, I will call CTA in the ER. But usually we will try to do the body move first. Okay, so it sounds like you guys are also using the D-dimer first to try to limit the amount of CTA use. Okay. Uh, uh, do you use the, the PERC rule to determine if your patient needs to get a D-dimer? If they are low enough risk based on the well score, do you then apply uh, the PERC rule? Or is this something that is not used in your practice? Uh, in our hospital, the PERC rule is not routinely used. That's, that's how sometimes I uh, do use them to uh, rule out PA in some low risk patient. Okay. Yep, exactly. It's used for our low risk patients. Um, can be used if it's part of your hospital protocol. Um, to not to determine if your patient would even require a D dimer if they're low enough risk on the Wells criteria. Um, I always think it's helpful to know the original exclusion criteria. 
uh, when these rules were developed. Um, if the patient had any signs of transient tachycardia at any point, not just when the, this rule was applied. Um, if the patient is on a concurrent beta blocker, which I think is something a lot of the times our trainees forget about when they are trying to apply the PERC rule, um, or if their baseline SpO2 is less than 95. So let's work on an example. Uh, we have a 40-year-old female uh, who fractured her femur about two weeks ago, and she's status post uh internal reduction and repair, is coming in with shortness of breath, is tachycardic to 103, and her left leg is swollen, but she says it's been that way since her surgery. Does she meet the criteria for uh, PERC, meaning that we wouldn't have to get a D-dimer on her? It's a reminder. Here's our PERC criteria. Likely she does not. So although she's less than 50, she's tachycardic when she comes in. I did not give you her O2 sats, but she was sat in while on room air. She had unilateral leg swelling and had recent surgery within the last four weeks. Um, so that qualifies her uh, that she would require likely a D-dimer. Her well score, we think about it. Does anybody want to calculate what her well score would be and see if we would stick with just a D-dimer or if we would get a CTA for this patient? score at the high risk if 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 this is my patient I will decide with CTA. You decide CTA. Okay. Um yeah I think that she is right at that four limit. So she you could argue if she has clinical signs and symptoms of a DVT with her leg being swollen for the past two weeks after a recent surgery on the extremity. If you're concerned about it with her being short of breath, you could give her three points is it the number one diagnosis? It's questionable with the amount of history I gave you. Her heart rate is over 100. So at that point, she is already at 4.5. Um, or if you would keep going, if you decided to give her a zero on this first criteria, she had a mobilization um, and surgery within the past four weeks. So that's a three. Uh, no previous known PE or DVT, no hemoptysis, and no malignancy. So as you can see, there is some inter-provider uh, gestalt that goes into this criteria to be used. And I agree with you, Dr. Hotu, that if, you know, if this was your patient in front of you and you were concerned enough about them with the history, you would just go forward with the CTA uh, if you're concerned for a PE and sometimes not wait for the D-dimer. Okay. Um, uh, the modified Geneva score is just something to be aware of. It sounds like maybe this is not a scoring system that you use in your hospitals. This is not a scoring system that I use in my practice. Um, it's supposed to help decrease the need for a CTA. Um, if uh, it ranges from zero to 22 points, which seems like a lot of points to me, um, and places people into low, medium, or high risk categories. Um, with a low risk still having a seven to nine incidence of PE, which I think is kind of why I'm not as keen on this scoring system as compared to uh, the PERC or the Wells, which seems to have um, a little bit of a higher sensitivity for PE. Um, but it's just another scoring system if this is something that comes into your practice. Um, also, if you are someone who still works in the inpatient setting, uh, either in the ICU, I know that sometimes uh, we had talked about maybe an ICU uh, fellow or physician helping uh, with these cases. Um, this was not validated for patients who are already admitted. This was just validated for patients who come into the emergency department 
from the outside world. So if we determined on our last patient, if they had a subsegmental PE, their vital signs were stable and we thought, hey, maybe we can send this patient home. If we got it to the point that they did not have an oxygen requirement, how do you determine if your patient is stable enough to go home and start anticoagulation and be followed up in a week or two weeks? You can initially use the Hestia criteria. If the patient has yes to any of these criteria, they don't recommend you starting treatment at home and recommending them come into the hospital for initiation of treatment. So obvious, some of these are very obvious. If any, the patient has any hemodynamic instability, if, if you needed a TPA or them to go in and get an embolectomy, if they are actively bleeding or they might be actively bleeding soon because of any uh, DOAX or thrombolytics you give them, if they needed additional oxygen, um, if they're having severe pain that they can't manage at home, if they're having social issues, which I think is a lot of the times a uh, problem for us here in the United States, if they're homeless, if they can't have any family help in 24 hours, that would be a reason to bring them in to help initiate therapy. If they have any liver impairment, which might uh, impede what kind of anticoagulants they get, if they're pregnant, if they have a known history of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, in which case they would need to be watched closely, any of those reasons, they can't go home with their new anticoagulant. There's something called the PESI score, which Dr. Nonle mentioned earlier, um, which kind of helps us stratify their 30-day mortality rate for uh, starting anticoagulants and sending them home. Do I use has blood before I give anticoagulation for a PE patient? Sometimes, uh, yes. I feel like more often I use it when I have my patients who have AFib. Jane, do you typically do a has blood calculation if you're going to send a patient home after they've um, been diagnosed with a PE? I guess for me, I do the has blood more for AFib as well. I know there are some. Um, more recent studies that are like questioning whether or not, depending on the subsegmental and smaller PEs, whether or not you have to start them on anticoagulation. But mm -hmm. for most of my patients, unless they are acutely presenting with another problem that involves mm -hmm. bleeding or contraindications at that point, I I just start them on um, the anticoagulation. Okay. That's fair. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any input on that. If anybody else is putting, is using has blood in addition to the PESI score before sending anybody home and appreciate your input. All right. Um, just also kind of knowing the limitations of your scoring systems uh, for your PESI score. If your patient is elderly and has any comorbidities, they are immediately placed in a high risk category. So I think that might also kind of be along um, with adding on the has blood scoring system to this is that any of our older patients who have any comorbidities, they're initially placed in a higher class and it makes it less likely that they go home for anticoagulant initiation. Um, whereas on here, it's been noted that patients who have submassive PEs uh, can sometimes incorrectly get low risk PESI scores um, and it's a known issue. So if you're trying to calculate your PESI score, but your patient has, you know, a submassive PE with signs of right heart strain or has an elevated BNP or an elevated troponin, the PESI score doesn't uh, account for that and can put them incorrectly into a low classification score and make you think you could send somebody home uh, to be appropriately treated when they would be more appropriately served being admitted to the hospital. Okay, this is a big table. I'm not sure what uh, everyone is sending their patients home on if they are appropriate. We go through everything. We've diagnosed a subsegmental P 
PE. They do not have a submassive PE. They pass our PESI score where they can be started on home anticoagulants. I'm not sure if people have a preferred agent that they start them on um, or if people are automatically just coming into the hospital and being transitioned onto warfarin. I know in my practice, it's typically Eliquis uh, with a seven day initiation of 10 milligrams BID and then getting transitioned down to five milligrams. It's also just good to note that if your patient has poor renal function, I know it's not listed really in the PESI score, but uh, all of these DOACs that are listed are contraindicated for severe renal impairment. We touched upon the possibility of intubating our patient, uh, going back to them as they became hypotensive and required a significant amount of oxygen support. As Dr. Nanle appropriately responded, that the first step would be to support the blood pressure with fluids and uh, vasopressors, and norepinephrine is typically the first line. Or if you don't have norepinephrine ready, a push dose presser to be able to decrease the likelihood of collapse and decompensation when you intubate somebody. Um, when you, if you do have to intubate somebody who has a PE, noting to decreasing some of your tidal volumes to limiting that um, decrease in preload like we talked about um, so that they can continue with their perfusion. Um, we kind of touched on also uh, using high flow if it's appropriate in your setting or if you have BiPAP, um, even with if they have continued hypoxia, but you have to monitor if they're also becoming hypotensive with the um, decreased preload imposed by the BiPAP. Okay, quick question. If you want to put your responses in the chat again, um, which of the following is highly sensitive for predicting the absence of PE and use for patients whose probability for PE is unlikely and who may need only minimal additional testing? Okay, seeing a couple Bs, I agree. Okay, so we're revisiting our initial patient. Said they're still having coffee fits, but instead of just, it starts at, started out as small amounts of blood, but now they're seeing more when they cough and they're getting short of breath and they're still having some chest pain. Your opening vital signs for this patient are still mild tachycardia, borderline hypotension. They're tachypnic. Oh, sorry, guys. That's 91 on room air. That's not just 9%. Um, they're speaking in full sentences. They are tachypnic. They do not have any retractions. Um, you don't hear any odd breathing sounds, no wheezes, no crackles. They're pale. They have one plus distal pulses and cool extremities. And they have a tissue with them with some small bloody sputum. You're obtaining, similar to what we discussed earlier, your baseline labs, your coags, a CT with contrast if possible, because you're concerned about the decreased uh, SpO2, the tachycardia, and the borderline hypotension. You get an EKG, it's sinus tachycardia, and your patient was placed on the monitor, and IV access was obtained. Something to think, and an ABG was also obtained, as Dr. Nonley uh, mentioned earlier. One additional thing to think about in this patient who's having a larger amount of hemoptysis is adding on inflammatory markers if something like diffuse alveolar hemorrhage is considered. Additional history is provided by the patient and his family. He's still a six, this is a 65-year-old female or male with a chronic cough that's become intermittently bloody for the past few months. And last night, her symptoms have worsened, and now she's coughing up more blood. She's unable to quantify how much, but she's also having left-sided sharp chest pain with coughing only. No fevers, but has had a history of weight loss. She has a known history of hypertension, but does not take any daily medications. And about a year ago, she was told about a lump in her lung 
but hasn't followed up on any testing. Her only social history is that she has a 50 pack year history of tobacco use. Your physical exam, this woman's sleepy, but she awakens to your voice and she's alert and oriented. Her conjunctiva are pale and she has small amount of bloody sputum in her posterior oropharynx. She's tachypnic uh, with some mild increased work of breathing, decreased breath sounds with mild crackles to left, middle, and lower lobe when you're able to listen more closely. The right side of her lung is clear. She's tachycardic. Uh, you did a rectal exam because you noted the pale conjunctiva, and we were concerned if this was hemoptysis or pseudohemoptysis, and her occult blood was negative. Her extremities, we went over their cool throughout. She has clubbing noted to her fingers and does not have any asymmetry or edema. This is the EKG. Sorry, guys, we're running short on time, so I'm going through a little bit faster. This is sinus tachycardia. It's not meant to trick you. This is your chest x-ray. Your patient with that chest x-ray is reassessed because you're called to the bedside and they have a severe coughing episode and they have a coughing episode that fills up a small basin with a bright red blood and they're having increasing respiratory distress and looking more tired. They're tachycardic. They are now hypotensive and you've placed them on the highest amount of oxygen you can and they are still hypoxic. Your labs start coming back. She's noted to be newly anemic to nine. Her troponin is 0 0.2. Her lactate is 1.8. Her D-dimer is 400, just slightly elevated. And her ABG is 7.35 pH, uh, PCO2 of 65, an O2 of 35, and a bicarb of 20. What is your next step in this patient? For someone with uh, this uh, uh, very severe uh, hemorrhagic as well as a hemodynamic instability, I think the first of all is to uh, stabilize their airway by uh, intubation first. I agree with and you. Then, uh, mm -hmm. There's some uh, fluid for the uh, blood pressures. Mm -hmm. that, that, that is the thing I, I want to do first. Okay. Are there any special tools or things that you have to think about in someone who's having significant hemoptysis? Because otherwise, I agree with you. This is somebody who, again, is in a tenuous situation, who is already hypotensive and tachycardic, who could have cardiovascular collapse when you intubate them. It sounds like there's quite a lot amount of quite a lot of blood in the oropharynx. So I would be sure to have a lot of suction if you're able to have two at the bedside uh, to make sure that you're going to be able to have your best first pass at attempting to intubate this patient. Uh, looking at that chest x-ray, it looked like there was a large consolidation versus a malignancy on the left side. Uh, knowing that and believing that this is a an erosion either into a vessel or um, into something else nearby, I would also think about using a larger uh, into ET tube compared to normal, this is a 65-year-old female, whereas in females, I am normally reaching for a 7.0 tube. In someone who's having massive hemoptysis, you're reaching for at least an 8.0 to be able to think about uh, doing a bronchoscopy on this patient later. So you get your stuff ready to intubate her. And going on, this case is written, if you main stem it, going towards the right, knowing thinking that the blood is likely coming from the left side of her chest based on that initial x-ray, then your post-intubation x-ray looks like the screen on your left. If you intubate 
And as is normal at the normal level above the um, carina, she aspirates the blood into both sides of her lungs and you have a much harder time ventilating her. So this is something where if you're able to use your bougie and angle and attempt to main stem, that is something that I recommend. I have seen someone put two endotracheal tubes. If you're able to main stem both of them, it does not make your pulmonologist happy because normally you can't fit two 8.0 or 8.5s in the oropharynx. Um, but I've seen someone try. Additional management that you can think about once you have secured the airway is nebulized TXA if you have it. If you do not have nebulized TXA that you can run through the vent or if a patient was still awake um, with a diffuse alveolar hemorrhage uh, that was being managed on some high flow, then you can uh, use an IV uh, TXA doing 1,000 milligrams first and then decreasing down to 500 milligrams every eight hours. You also have to think about that the likely underlying issue for your patient is that they are severely anemic. So calling for blood early, um, reversing any known uh, anticoagulants, uh, either PCC or any direct reversal therapies, if they had any known medications. If you get an INR and it's greater than two, getting FFP early or using a, a cryoprecipitate or fibrinogen concentrate if you get their fibrinogen back and it's less than two. Again, thinking about replacing the platelets and then consider DDAVP if your patient is uremic or has a history of severe kidney disease. Um, if your patient's unstable, like this patient, uh, you need to talk to either your pulmonologist or your interventional radiologist if they can go in and embolize this uh, likely uh, bronchial artery, um, or if this is possible, possibly a patient who would best be served with thoracic surgery to get a lobectomy or a pneumectomy. Our primary diagnosis for this patient is massive hemoptysis with secondary diagnosis of lung neoplasm, anemia, and hemorrhagic shock. Um, Massive hemoptysis definition is any one episode of greater than 50 milliliters or more than 500 milliliters in 24 hours. I will often give patients a urine sample cup or a larger container and say any time that you are coughing up blood, spit it into here so we can quantify it. Um, with your patient with hypotension and your need to intubate them, you have to think about adjusting your medications to maximize your resuscitation. So that may mean decreasing the dose of your induction agent. I know sometimes a paralytic isn't used if you don't have it available. Um, and then consider blood or uh, vasopressors prior to intubation. Most of the time, the hemoptysis is due to a bronchial artery, uh, which has been eroded into or burst. This is under systolic pressure, so the bleeding can be brisk. You're mostly just a bridge into source control. If you're able to get the airway controlled and get them over to get a CTA, uh, to be able to visualize where they need to go. That would be ideal, but sometimes you just don't have that option. As we spoke about, this patient is either going to interventional radiology to get a bronchial artery embolization or to surgery uh, for a thoracic uh, exploration, or can go to pulmonology to have a, a bronchial blocker placed or to have a bronchoscopy. If you're able to keep your patient awake, just remember that our patients are better at clearing their own blood from their respiratory system by coughing, much better than we are by suctioning. So if they're able to stay awake and still uh, maintain their airway by coughing, that's preferable to us intubating and taking their airway and trying to catch up with suctioning. Oftentimes, suctioning can be overwhelmed by how much blood is in there when you go in and if your first attempt at intubation fails, it's often recommended to just go straight to a cricothyrotomy in the front of the neck to optimize your um, airway, to secure your airway. Our last question before uh, I let you guys go for the morning, um, the best position for a patient with massive hemoptysis, if it's coming from the left lung, after we've intubated this patient, how should they be laying in the bed? Is it prone? left lateral decubitus, right lateral decubitus, or supine? Okay. I have one answer. We'll wait for one more. Okay. 
you guys are correct. It is B. Um, whereas if this is not blood or pus, it is bad lung up. But in the case of massive hemoptysis, or if there is concern for a massive empyema or pus or any type of aspiration, it's noted to be bad lung down or the lung that is affected goes um, inferior and they're laying on that side. So this is just a visual representation of what we talked about. Bad lung down, correcting your coagulopathies, reversing your anticoagulants if necessary, thinking about nebulized TXA if you have it or possible IV TXA, although that has been a controversial topic recently, and thinking about getting blood into these patients early if necessary. We won't do this last one because it seemed too much. It was on the heart score and the uh, GRACE-1 scoring. But to just go over everything, we talked about PEs today. Um, early POCUS can help you determine if this is uh, submassive. Um, we talked about the PERC and the WELLS criteria, helping to determine if you need a D-dimer and to help spare patients who are low risk from requiring a CTA. Re uh, evaluating the necessity for thrombolytics in your patients with uh, contraindications uh, versus what your hospital protocol is. Always remember to reassess your patients often, especially with suspected PE, because they can decompensate quickly. If your patient is well enough to go home, then consider the PESI score. Um, if it's subsegmental, so they can go home. Uh, massive hemoptysis, there is a large differential for massive hemoptysis. And the earlier you're able to get imaging, either a chest x-ray to help you plan for future if you need to intubate versus getting a CTA can help you and your colleagues. Um, thinking about getting blood early, reversing anticoagulations, and replacing any factors that appear to be low and are uh, increasing the rate of the hemoptysis. Okay, everybody. Thank you again for this week. Uh, next week, we will have a case. Uh, Dr. Nanley, I just wanted to confirm, did you have the case for last week? I know it was kind of, um, it was hard to tell because it sounded like you had to run off to intubate somebody. Uh, I, I hesitate and I, I am completing the PowerPoint. Okay, perfect. Sounds good. Um, Dr. Shakira Bandolin is going to be leading our session next week. And I appreciate everyone's time today. Thank you all for participating and we will see you next week. Happy holidays. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.